Today's panel will be even more interdisciplinary and more challenging. Um, of course, I do not have to introduce uh, Chris Lipkemann, who has just given us a very thrilling input and I think plenty of topics to discuss. But I would like to greet the participants uh, of that panel. I will introduce them very shortly so that uh, I'm not the one who's speaking too much, but that they can uh, talk. We have an hour's time, which is not very much when we think about uh, six speakers and a lot of topics. So our um, first panelist, panelist is Margarita Lee. Please join me here on stage. Um, I think most of you know her. She is assistant professor here at ATH Zurich, where she leads the Vision for Robotics Lab. She's uh, an informatician, actually, and uh, she works on uh, robotic perception. Her interests lie in uh, computer vision, and her work contributed to the first vision-based autonomous flight of a small um, drone. Then, uh, Shio Kawashima. She is a civil engineer and an associate professor in the civil engineering and engineering mechanics, mechanics department of Columbia University in New York. Um, she works in experimental cement and concrete research. Um, she's researching concrete applications and the control of the properties of fresh state concrete. She's also interested in nanocomposites and the integration of nano modification with the use of supplementary cementious materials to aid the design of sustainable infrastructural materials. We will come back to this sustainability question. Gudela Grote. Yes. She is professor of work and organizational psychology, um, also here at ETH Zürich. Her research focuses on the increasing flexibility and virtuality of work and on the consequences for the individual and organizational management of uncertainty. Um, in particular, she focuses on effects of new technologies on work processes, teamwork and standardization, also topics uh, that are closely linked to uh, robots and digitalization. Hanif Kara, he is a, a practicing engineer, first of all. Um, he is a director and co-founder of AKT2, and he is interested in a design-led approach and in innovative form, material uses, and complex analysis methods. He is also professor in practice of architectural technology at the Graduate School of Design in Harvard, so he is somehow the link between practice and also teaching. He is researching new forms and uh, tries to connect design and industry. Fabio Gramatio, I do not really need to introduce, but I will do all the same. He is an architect, but uh, with a multidisciplinary interest, ranging from computational design and robotic fabrication to material innovation. He is also um, owner, co-owner of an architectural uh, office in uh, Zurich, together with um, Matthias Kohler, who is also here. And uh, well, um, with the world's first architectural robotic laboratory in Zurich, which you know quite well, actually uh, they created a new research field, uh, merging advanced architectural design and ad ad uh, additive fabrication processes with uh, industrial robots. So, let me have a seat too. <laughs> and, uh, well, I will, um, my first question, of course, uh, is for Chris Lübkemann. We have heard in the introduction that we are uh, going towards a digital building culture. You also mentioned that new tools uh, that are evolving also create new ways of working together, new ideas and uh, also new conceptions of what is possible and uh, what the future could be. So now my first question, of course, is the most difficult one. Um, what could be a digital building culture? Hmm. 
Mm. <laughs> so everyone announces okay. it, but yeah. uh, so, what okay. will it be? Yeah, what so could it be? There's a couple, a couple ways to answer that. Number one, no, the new tool sets uh, allow us to investigate and explore both performance and options in ways which we never could before. And so um, if we take a look at the big data and the, the information which we can gather to understand how something's actually behaving, it allows us to then morph our understanding so that we can then change the design um, into sort of into what could potentially also be. For me, the best example of that is, is, is a tree, which why I chose that, or both those two, because this is this capture, create, and construct, where you're able to look at the existing conditions in a way that we couldn't before and, and bring in... I'm not really answering your question. I'm sort of buffaloing it right now. I, mean, I know I... I trust you. Yeah. Um, so we can actually this capture, this capture, create, and construct. And I also think that... Um, we have to have an increased understanding of the design, kinds of teams we need to have. Okay, So there's the tools, and then there's the teams, and there's the time. I like things in threes, too. The tools just described. The teams, probably many in this room who've worked on in interdisciplinary teams, being able to have material scientists and engineers and architects actually working in the same kind of tools environment. And then the time to let things cook, which we don't really have anymore in practice. Uh, usually we have to do things too fast. But having the time to investigate what could be and the, the time to construct. Um, that's a really bad answer, but uh, we're just going to go with that for the moment. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, do you agree with that, Fabio? Go. Help me out here. By one company cannot be done by, by one genius person, but needs a collective effort. And that is also a bit what you said. We need mm. to make sure that everybody follows. Yeah. That the discussion is sure. large, and that we start to 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 build a, a common value systems. Yeah. Uh, because it's not so just about the act of building, but it has such large implications and such long-reaching implications. That only uh, I think only the, 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 the very concept of culture can make justice to this. To this. Uh, so let me just build it because culture is amazing. Behavioral patterns, right? This is it's either accepted or anticipated or expected behavioral patterns. And if I look around around the cultures which I've experienced within within Arab. On one hand, there's this Arab culture. On the other hand, the culture of the Hong Kong office is quite different than the culture of the London office or Berlin, right? Because of these expected behaviors and how you interact with each other. And so I think what you're asking is, which is the correct, is digital building culture. What are the behavioral patterns which we can be expecting or trying to train up or teach that help us move towards and, and these anticipated norms, which you just mentioned. Right? And as I said, the respect and understanding the vocabulary that kind of transcend perhaps local culture. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that getting a little bit better, a little closer. <laughs> yes, yeah. actually, bone. It, it works also the other way around. So the, the tools are forming our culture and our way of thinking, but we are the ones who make the tools. I mean, the, the human beings are tool makers per definition. And um, maybe if I ask you, I mean, you are, um, you are working on the vision of, um, of, uh, of robots. That, that's a choice. I mean, um, soon we will have uh, those robots who have vision, who can interact really, who can react, um, who can decide. Um, we have decided... It's our choice to develop them, and it will be our choice to use them. So 
is that is that an issue when um, when you work on this? So it, it it is clear you are working in a in a context uh, of building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is is that um, mm -hmm. are you talking about this uh, in your group? Of course. I mean, <clears throat> sorry. Robotics is a very diverse field, and uh, that has gives us the pleasure to try to envision um, where robotics can have a useful application, and architecture and construction is one of them. Um, robotics also is traditionally, um, or most often, um, co-aligned with military applications. So, to me personally, it's a very nice opportunity to apply robotic perception, and in, more in particular, my work on drones, um, onto something that can be useful for humanity, not just destroy it. Well, building is surely very useful. I mean, we are living in buildings and working in buildings. Um, and we are um, also making buildings. Uh, we have seen that uh, the productiv productivity of the building sector is increasing very slowly. Uh, the building sector is said to be um, very traditional, um, not very open to, uh, to new technologies, to evolving very slowly. Um, what, is, uh, what is the reason for this uh, low speed? Well, I would go back to your first question in trying to answer that. Then, if, I, if you don't mind, Circle, yes. but just so they get used to my accent, I just want to... <laughs> I just want to continue the theme of the, hip, the hippie, hippie cools. I want to thank the dudes that have actually uh, invited us here, me in particular, because I'm quite conflicted in many ways. I don't really recognize myself often. But the point is that um, I'm here because they, I think, early on, probably 20 years ago, discovered what you've said without saying it. They discovered the phenomenon of the decay of the discipline, which today is now, you know, still being excavated in many disciplines. But I think in the built environment, the kind of work that they were doing 15, 20 years ago, and it's gone like a rocket when the third dude has now joined them. But also I'd like to thank Russell and Kathleen, because I won't get another chance for being behind this, because... It's good to have these dudes, but you also got to have the people who want to pay, put patents into them and people who want to support that. So speaking more as a supporter, I would say that um, what we've seen is the advancement is very rapid and is particularly visible in the last 10 years or so because we can see it. I mean, it, it, I don't think it's changed as much. The rate may have changed because the brute force of computation without any question is something to cope with rather than challenge. So the built environment uh, disciplines, uh, I won't re re label them as engineer architect, but those disciplines and, and the way these people have started to think early on and what's going on in the, the afternoon I spent here is the early signs or mature signs of how we will affect what we really want to do. Because when you spot the decay of the discipline, it also becomes a, a kind of a, a task, it's a fetish. You, you move your eye away from the task. And I think what the real task is, is something that Chris pointed out, which is how do we solve the problem of the world in the lightest way? What is the lightest we can touch the earth? So everything they're doing is geared, in my opinion, towards that. And the other extreme of culture, uh, going back to their point of technology and, and the build system, the culture that I think we're moving towards, and very obviously, is that large-scale uh, human communities can now be optimized once and for all by using data, analyzing it, and, and then therefore applying it. That phenomenon is still relatively young, but it has some risks um, in the sense that if you leave it to data and if you leave it to uh, the industry, uh, you have the problem that it may actually lead us to not solving some of these problems. So I'm not entirely, um, I'm absolutely certain that everything that's going on here will change the industry. The problem we have is that within industry, construction is way behind. There was a moment when practitioners like me were slightly ahead of academia, 
But today, the gap between construction and practice is bigger. I think between academia and design is huge. Um, actually, there are only a few spots, and this is a hot spot where you're kind of jumping, leapfrogging both of those problems by going straight to construction with what we saw in the gorgeous DFAB house. And I have to congratulate all of you. I've been watching this thing for four years, skeptically, but it's incredibly gorgeous. So I would say that there is a, a response that this kind of event <coughs> continues, and hopefully we can bring these gaps together. And they are absolutely massive. I want to stop because I can go on. 20 minutes on this. Okay, so you mean, um, in short, just do it and do what, the others will follow? It, it isn't just as that. I think do it properly because, uh, I mean, we were talking earlier about there is some competition appearing. I think one of the cool, cool dudes said to me, I have seen quite a lot of these things because I'm so old compared to all of you, but I can say that competition is not necessarily about money or resource or giving them lots of tools, it's the culture with which you apply that and how you make the coalition across disciplines. Now we're calling it interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, but that gets me and Chris uh, kind of edgy a little bit on which one of us is right. But the coalition of these disciplines has been going on in medicine and, and, and other things. And I think this is what I see as, as is happening to you. There are many people trying to follow it. And, and there is no, nothing wrong, as the president said, with, with people. For, it's the biggest compliment you can get. But the funding that you're getting, but also the way it's being applied, and, and the time you're taking, which is neither too long nor too quick, because there's a lot of quick fixes to all of this stuff. And I think technology that used um, you know, self-generating democratic processes in the last 10 years, some of us know about, which some people call parametric. It, you know, it was his kind of one of those moments when quick fixes were happening. What you're doing is much, much deeper, and I'd like to think that having 40% of the industry here is wonderful. The only dilemma I have is your industry doesn't talk to my industry. You're very secretive. Well, that's a mischief. Maybe it's I, a communication problem. Uh, sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now I just wanted to. To get back to the, this concept, is okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of of culture, because uh, as you said, change is uh, is uh, a constant. You know, it, you cannot negotiate it; it just happens. And uh, uh, in technological innovation, is also a constant. So we know that things will be there very soon, and the question is only what would will these things do? And uh, are they aligned with, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a vision that we can develop uh, in a collective, in a yeah. collective manner? And this is exactly what culture describes. It's a negotiation. And the problem a bit is still in our industry. We see we have the past and the future. You know, and the past is uh, the past is idealized, is romanticized. Ninety percent of people that talk about culture don't mean past culture, something you have to preserve because globalization and all this uh, past change and so on uh, questions it. And uh, uh, we have to change, radically change its perspective because the culture we have to build up is the f culture that, that holds, sustains our future. And there we can rethink certain uh, uh, mechanisms we already know. So it's not about the disruption. You know, but we have to think in the future with the same sort of consistency of including everybody. You know, because I'm sure if we do not now, after the first phase where uh, uh, you know, some people, we among them, many, many other people have just done things, if we don't start a large discussion and find an agreement, then probably I will not like 90% of the things that I will have be obliged to use in 20 years if I'm still there you know, in my daily job. Mm -hmm. And this is a, 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 can be a problem, you know, if we, we just say, okay, you do this and you do this, and then we meet at some point. We have to question and discuss, discuss all the time. And I think these, these events are here for that, to evaluate where we are going and to, to set these vectors. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one point where everybody here is 
agrees is uh, that we try to shape a sustainable future. Um, is uh, digital fabrication uh, or digital methods, new concrete technology, could those be a way for a more efficient um, structure so that we use less material, that we can build more efficiently with less waste? Is that um, a, a, a research goal also? Yeah. Um, uh, so I think there was a lot of um, great discussions and talks at Digital Concrete um, and I think um, there's a lot of potential to make uh, concrete systems more sustainable to, through digital fabrication. Um, so some examples are, there's already a lot of ongoing research in the cement and concrete field in finding alternative binders or alternative clinkers because we know concrete has a very high CO2 footprint. So that's already ongoing and we can integrate that into digital fabrication and actually, some of these binders, uh, like geopolymers, um, they can exhibit really fast setting or early strength gain. They can be chemically activated. And so those kinds of features could be really useful for something like 3D extrusion-based printing. Um, I also saw some talks on uh, taking advantage of particle packing. And so if we do that, um, if we optimize that in a very effective way, then we can also reduce cement content. Um, and on the structure side, I saw some really interesting ideas of um, optimization and so just selectively deposit material where the load paths are. And so that's already been demonstrated here. Um, and so through approaches like particle bed printing, you can really start to reduce the amount of material. And I think the major, the most obvious thing is that through 3D printing um, or digital fabrication, uh, you don't need any formwork, or there are approaches where you completely eliminate formwork. And so that's a huge material saving. Um, and that actually starts to make um, the cost and material use um, independent of how complex um, a structure is. So if you have a really complex structure versus a really plain structure, Digital fabrication will allow you to um, pretty much use the same material for both of these types of projects. So uh, that was a long answer, but I think there's a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good example because you, you have the goal and then you have very different disciplines coming together. So you have material technology, you have uh, the, the printer, of course, you need informaticians, you need structural engineers, uh, maybe you also need architects to design uh, the form, so it's, uh, it's a, a lot of different disciplines coming together for a task that uh, 100 years ago was solved by one person who did it somehow. But now it's, uh, it's an interdisciplinary team with highly specialized people, mm -hmm. experts working, but then they have to cooperate. And we have heard that sometimes that's not quite easy because they speak different languages. Now, um, Gudela, what... Um, what do we know about communication in these interdisciplinary groups? I mean, we all try here somehow, but maybe um, there are better ideas than just trying. Do we know something about the interaction? Do we need translators? Do we have to become translators ourselves? Maybe I start with a very simple story that I always tell in the lecture because I think it's still, to me, mind-boggling. It's a very, very basic finding from social psychology. When you put three people around a table that are supposed to make a decision and you give each of these people some pieces of knowledge that are equal, so some things that all these three people have in their heads, and then you give them some pieces of knowledge that only one of them has, right? And this is what interdisciplinarity is about, right? You want those non-shared pieces of knowledge to come to the table. And what you find in these very, very basic experiments is that these people will spend the whole time about the stuff they all share. So all the knowledge that they have already and everyone has, they will discuss and then make a decision based on that. And that unshared bit that actually would make the decision much better just doesn't come out. And this has been replicated over and over. And then now the question, what can you do? And one part of that story is actually to be willing 
to deal with conflict. I mean, not so amazing, but that will get people to really start talking. And obviously, in any interdisciplinary field, there is lots of food for conflict. And then the next thing is that you need to learn to do that. And obviously, to do that in a way that is not harmful on a personal level. So it's not like really talking about differences around whatever the issue is and not having all the stereotypes, not having immediately attributions to uh, that guy is stupid anyway. And all that, that happens just when groups come together. So to, to learn to deal with conflict, I think, is one very important thing and really use the, the constructive element of conflict because that brings out that shared knowledge that has been, or unshared knowledge rather, I mean, that has been shown, so work through that. And then you can obviously also ask, I mean, what do you need for, for this to happen, to pe for people to dare to deal with conflict? And one concept that has been around the world now, and even Google discovered that that's the quintessential bit of teamwork, is so-called psychological safety, which has been defined as, I mean, am I willing, or do I feel safe to take interpersonal risk? Do I feel okay in the group enough? that I can ask the stupid question, I can bring up the conflict, etc. So that is another element that I think is very important. And just lastly, and then I'll stop again, but to your question of digital culture, to me actually that term is in a way fascinating because you could also understand it as a paradox. Because culture is not really, I mean digital is technology, right? I mean that's the association we have. And then culture, clearly, the association we have is about social life, about the, if you will, very basically non-technical, right? So how do you bring about that tension of having technological systems and having social systems dealing with that? Um, and again, to use that tension in a, in a constructive way, I think, is core to maybe what one could call then digital culture. Difficult to also say is that um, if you look at culture as a word and you borrow from anthropology or somewhere else, racial is an, is an easy one. You know, we get offended by appropriate, appropriate cultures because the society is such that, you know, when a white guy acts like a black guy or things like that, we get offended. The black guy gets offended. And I think it's not this different in, in the built environment because when, when you're appropriating the other's discipline, unempathetically or because you suddenly can actually take over because you think you know what he's doing, then there is a risk that this uh, conflict is not productive. It's actually confrontation rather than conflict. So the way in which they, this culture is appropriated is very, very important in my view. And one benefit of that is in the old days, the person holding the pencil on the sketch controls. Wonderful now because we don't need the pencil you see what the works, the works are going on now. That doesn't mean that you don't be selfish at some point in your own discipline and bring it back to something that has beauty and other, other qualities of the built environment, including sustainability. But what, you have to be very cautious about what culture means to different people. Mm. Engineers find it quite offensive when architects jump into our world we will easily go into your world and steal anything we want. And that, that's the way it works, it, it, which, is not, which is not very friendly, but it is what goes on in, in general, in my view. When we bring uh, people like you, and, and you in particular, we're going at the two edges that neither of us know very well, architects and engineers. And I think that this interdisciplinarity of adding the sharpness of some of these other disciplines that we're seeing producing this work, has the potential to hopefully er erode these boundaries and, and potentially stop talking also about culture until a point when you really need to design the building for a sheikh or the building for a religious whatever, and you can introduce the cultural moment at that point. We can, up to that point, bring up the industry way up it should be today, in my view. So I'm slightly nervous about the term culture on its own. Mm. Well, Chris, uh, you are leading uh, an interdisciplinary research team. Mm. 
How are you doing this? What's your secret? Yeah, um, there's two parts to the answer. The first part is um, respect and curiosity. I think there's an order for... Uh, I have like a physicist, a systems biologist, a couple architects, art pedagogue, media studies, user interface, computer scientists. I've got a whole really interesting broad group. I think what's very important is mutual respect and a belief that someone else has something to contribute to your problem and a desire to hear that. Not thinking you already have the solution that you're looking, you've got the problem, you're trying to work at that. And so I think that's, that's part one to it. I think that's actually quite critical. Um, and, and the other is, I think, clarity of purpose and clarity of mission. Within ERA, you know, my team, I said lead two teams, or three, foresight, research, innovation. The foresight is looking at trends in the future, and there the mission is very clear trying to make sure we're aware of what's happening that could impact us and to share that, right? Because it was very important to share. And therefore, we need economists. We need to interact with poli- politically astute. You know, so we, we need to do all this. The research is we're employee-owned, so we invest back into our staff. There is more managing and helping and empowering others. And that's, I think, a really important part within ours is trying to empower rather than control. I think when we're looking at this interdisciplinarity, or if we're talking about that, it's sort of, if you will, is how do you empower the solution set rather than control? And this is, this is for me and my team, this is something that's really kind of important. Mm-hmm. This is unique within our situation, right? That, I think that's a slightly different ballgame. What's your experience you also have uh, quite a mixed team. Well, I, just to respond to that point, um, we, when we started, it was a very young practice, it's only 20 years old, so we had this concern about how do we get into the gaps, similar to the way you guys have uh, created this in the pedagogical sense. How do we get into the gap of the things that are being left behind uh, in practice? So our game was really not to necessarily change the discipline effectively as a structural engineering discipline, but to create the other disciplines within there. So we have a team within the office that is operating as an NGO, so it's, it's profitless. And you protect that team, and it consists of many other disciplines. It has one of many of these people in it. Uh, and we used to call it the applied research team, but that, that was because we were still naive and we were talking about parametrics and so on. These days, we don't define them like that. That group has gotten bigger, and its main purpose is not only to disrupt the role of the structural engineer, but to challenge some of the questions that we are being asked, both by the architect and by our client. But then also try and, wherever we can, you know, in margins of innovation, because I don't think large-scale innovation like this goes on in practice. We only have space and time and resource to make small marginal changes to to, uh, innovation. So this group basically has supported us and has become the the reason why we're still floating, I think. If we'd stayed in the tradition, the tradition of structural engineers has a lot of resentment against some of the things that goes on outside our industry. But these people create this, and part of the way of, of funding that for us, and this goes on to the discussion on research, is because academia is not providing that, clients don't want to fund that, is you write it off as, in, as a practice early on, and that then creates a situation where they're protected, and you, you can actually still survive despite all the apes and bumps. So it, it's a, a kind of a local English version uh, of, of how we're creating these things, and we're learning from other industries. For Most of you will know the story of why the UK won seven out of the 14 cycling uh, medals in the last Olympics. It's incredible, I'm sure. Do, do we all know why that was? It was very simple. It was just the heating on the, on the, on the, before the, the, the cyclist actually cycled. I know Parker's written a book on this, the guy who invented it. 
They didn't reinvent cycling or the cycle or completely all of that. They just did a marginal change, which I believe was effectively heating the, 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 the clothes that the cyclists were wearing for the moment when they start, because most cyclists were failing, because usually that race starts later than they thought. And the temperatures change in your body, so it doesn't allow you to uh, kind of get to the peak. And he got that perfectly right, perfect temperature. And that is through a marginal innovation, just introducing heat to the muscle, not trying to build a new human or roboticize him. So I think our game plan when we started was that. And so far it survived. And, and the, the barrier, or the, I think the barrier that you will find very swift, swiftly is as we all succeed, we're less agile. And as people follow us, we have to keep reinventing, and that becomes quite difficult all of the time. You know, how do you do that? And that's where perhaps you know, we should take the discussion on what is research today. Well, let's talk about what is it research today. You, you um, mentioned resentment, and that's a very strong word. Um, it's, uh, but resentment stops curiosity. You, you talked about curiosity, you also mentioned uh, fall in love with the problem and not with the solution. Um, we were discussing this afternoon that uh, in such a team you have to take, to step back a little bit, to uh, take back your ego for a second and uh, concentrate on the problem, on the question. Um, what education do we need um, in order to empower uh, future uh, experts to have their expertise, but to share it? not to, to be afraid, so to, to have this um, psychological security and to, to leave this resentment behind them and, and really to, to, to be able to cooperate. Fabio, what, what are you experiencing with uh, your I, students? I think it all starts with uh, education. I don't like this world, uh, this term in this context so much because uh, uh, it's more about an experience, and I can experience this uh, by chance or because I do an internship at the right place, or I don't know. And uh, when I, uh, not on an abstract level, because if somebody tells me I won't believe, for example, and we, are, I mean, architects or any way educated, the classical education is we run the show and uh, we have the ideas and stuff and the contacts, and then somebody else tells us what you already knew uh, and allows us, you know. And we have to radically change our mind in these uh, terms because we don't go anywhere with this attitude. Uh, and there may be more than culture, we should talk about attitude. And there is also selfishness in this, you know, yeah. because I'm not a good person because I found out at a certain point in my life then to really listen to people can help me solve things that I could never, would never have even thought about. And to create the opportunities, and this could be done in academia or before academia or in society at large, where it make it clicks or you say, okay, I could have just said what I already know and not listened and not really interacted for many reasons, maybe for fear of whatever, you know, because uh, I, I wasn't educated in this way or my culture didn't allow for it, or really interacted, challenge myself. And once I, I, I probably, once I, the, 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 I find out that it's uh, uh, productive as a method, then I will apply it uh, as a natural sort of uh, system, method. You know, because I'm, 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 I'm selfish, I'm an opportunist, you know, I want to get to the goal. Mm -hmm. So there must, be, there must be a profit, a benefit yeah. um, for every single person in the group and also for the group as a whole. Now, we, when we talk about interaction and digitalization, the next question, of course, is uh, when do we uh, interact with robots? And can we have also this, this, uh, this experience, uh, this positive experience of interacting with robots? I mean, um, if, if the machine is really perfect, it, if it really has a perfect vision, um, Maybe we humans start to get complexes because we, our vision is maybe not so perfect. Can, can, can we work together, interact with robots um, with a very different uh, notion of trust mm -hmm. or security? 
It's a good question. <laughs> I hope we can interact in a positive way with robots. Of course, um, with respect to vision, I have to say we're still, humans are quite good at many more tasks than computers are good at. Um, there are tasks that computers can do better than, than we can. Um, but at least for me, I don't see this, um, I don't feel it's offensive. It's kind of an extension of, ah, if I cannot do it, maybe the computer can. One example. So um, now with deep learning techniques, we can have our computer um, trained on thousands of image, images, uh, identify whether they've seen this image of um, uh, a street uh, of you know, downtown Zurich um, and, and discover where, whether um, this system has seen it in the past, maybe a few years back, maybe it was um, daytime or nighttime or winter versus summer. So we have this what we call place recognition techniques that they can uh, really, using AI, um, distinguish whether these two images belong to the, come from the same place or not. And humans are not so fast or not so clear about making that decision. So I think it's very, um, I think of this change as quite a positive thing. In a similar way that maybe when I was a child I, I could live without my phone, but now I cannot live without my phone. I cannot live without the calculator on, on my phone. And it's okay for me if I'm not so fast in computing 56 times 39 because I have my um, calculator doing that for me. But I think of this as an extension of me in a way. Maybe some people don't like to think of it that way because it's not very comfortable. But um, I'm thinking of robots in a way of helping me instead of competing with me. So... Mm -hmm. And isn't this completely normal? Uh, I, I just think because in, in the, your question suggests that this relationship, because the robot is a tool at the end of the day, a very sophisticated, you know, but it's a tool because we create it. And uh, your question suggests that this relationship between us and our tool has been disturbed. And this is true for 150 years, maybe even more. Uh, we have been used to a uh, relationship that is uh, antagonist. You know, so we are one on one side, the, the machine is on the other side, and there is the there are many, many reasons why we have learned to distrust this mechanism, you know, because we didn't uh, own them anymore, they were too big, we didn't know how they worked, uh, we didn't control the whole process. But uh, the things we are talking about right now, the things we see there in the RFL being tested, uh, shaper tools, but also more and more experimental things, it's about not just the technology we can trust in the terms that the robot will not kill me, this is very <laughs> bottom line, but uh, where we can in, in install a positive relationship where we have control on the machine and the machine helps us doing things that we could not otherwise do, where we are proud about our knowledge about the machine and depending on where we are, maybe we are even the creators of the machine, not just the users, or we are something in between, you know. So this, also this distinction between the owner, the creator and the labor is modern. Uh, phenomena, you know, prior uh, industrialization, you know, the craftsman was both, you know, he was trained in using the tool, but he was uh, uh, making it better, and he was proud of this. So he was also an inventor. He was the, the you know, and I think we are could go back to such a, a relaxed relationship where the question doesn't make so much sense anymore, or let's say a new question can come up, but not this one, because this sort of belongs to a... But there is a, a real urgency. I was lucky, not by design, but by, uh, by accident, to be in a meeting yesterday, which was basically looking at, in Geneva, how we can rebuild the citadel in Aleppo. And it was, the meeting was set up six months ago, and I have to tell you that the analysis that's been done with the drones is so perfect. The speed with which that society is going to be Potentially, if, if you leave the ethics and the politics aside, but the tools that, that have surveyed this thing in six months, they've also cleaned all the weapons. So the very things that technology destroyed in one way, but they've cleaned it. And what I saw from a survey, I have never seen before. And it was incredible that they are talking about starting construction in six to eight weeks from now. Without the drones and the other surveys they've done, 
This would take six years. So there is an urgency about this stuff, and this is why I usually attend, because I'm very keen to steal and apply as fast as I can some of the things you're still doing. And I think many people are in that. I'm hoping the industry that attended was doing that, provided they pay you for it. That's the difference between an engineer and an architect. Well, <laughs> they do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But um, to me, it comes back to said, the era of augmentation. To me, the tools, whether it's robot or automation, these tools are augmenting our capabilities and, cap and capacity. And whether it's in exoskeletons in construction or you know, or helping workers not destroy their bodies or lift loads which they couldn't maybe lift as just with their normal muscles. I think these are things which we're going to be seeing. There's a really great anecdote from a contractor in, in Germany called Zublin who came and was sharing with us how they started the automation of some of their work processes. I think it's automation, not necessarily robotization. They asked the workers, who were very unionized, say, what jobs do you hate? Right? And they came back, so one of the things we hate is taking the temperature of asphalt before we lay it on the, on the streets. And so the first thing that they did is try to figure out a way they could automate the taking of the temperature of the asphalt in the delivery trucks. Yeah. And then the workers were just super happy because they didn't have to jump on the truck and get burnt and all this. So, so to me, it's really looking at augmenting and, uh, rather than replacing. And I think this is a, a mental map. And I think is with the experimental part is where do we push those boundaries? Taking the temperature of asphalt is not really a boundary. Right? But what else you could do, that becomes the boundary setting. That's where the research comes in rather than the development. I think that's, that's also how we have to differentiate between these two kind of domains. There's a research, boundary pushing, development, applying in situ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now what, what you're mentioning now is that um, actually we have, we have research like, uh, like it is practiced here at ETH, which is really high-end research and with very open minds and, uh, and, and a lot of interdisciplinary questions and... Uh, changing teams and always new questions also. And then you have the building practice where they have very clear, small problems that have to be solved. And by small, I do not mean um, um, that, that they are not important because uh, as, as you have said, Hanif, uh, a, a very small change can make a very big um, change actually in the practice. But um, how, how can, can we merge those two worlds? I mean, this, uh, this very open-minded research and then the everyday work. You have to follow religion. Because if you look at religion and its history, the one reason it survived, because it's open source code. Mm. Okay. So the biggest barrier is, is, is that, is whether we're willing to produce this intellectual property, share it, uh, you know, equally, and, and then I think there is a potential that there are risks, but the current big names who own us, you know, the five, big five, don't necessarily share. They do not share the technology. So I think open source code, and if anybody, I don't care which religion people are, if you look at your own religion, you will see that the only reason it survives is it's an open source. So you can actually interpret it, and you can get anything you want about your religion, and reapply. But that's not the case with code at the moment in, in our world or with some of the innovations we're seeing from the big five, certainly. I, I mean, I'm working for them, so I have to be careful how, how, to, how I put that. But it's, we, could, we could benefit from more, less barriers between us and them. And Europe has taken the first steps of that, I think. Get, get. Religion as open source. <laughs> what about the know. codex? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm an atheist. I can't say that right out. Well, they even have a so, religion. <laughs> so I, I won't get into, into those discussions. I'm not so sure. Okay, but, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe just, I mean, having the word for a moment, I mean, just going back to, I mean, whatever the relationship between people and technology, and I think a key term in there is what Fabio was saying, is who's in control of this, right? Um, and... What I find really interesting about the NCCR here and the collaborations you have is that you really bring in 
future users in terms of also future uh, employees that actually will work with these things and they can input into the process of development. And a lot of times I think technology is developed quite far away from then actually the people that will use it in work organizations. It's different from consumer products. I think there it's clear, well, we want to stay in control and people will not be able to sell us anything. If we, I mean, we still all fidget with the stuff and then we don't feel in control, but that's a different story. Um, but nevertheless, I think the key thing there is that, I mean, we're the people that buy it and therefore the people developing it have to somehow, to some extent, comply with whatever our needs or our imagined needs or whatever. But for people working in working organization, in work organizations and firms, that's different. I mean, they, don't, they usually don't get to choose the machine that they're going to work with, right? And the people developing that machine, they might have never have a talk to a worker ever, but they just have some nice technological idea. And this is what when then stuff comes together and it doesn't quite work. So having sort of big sites for experimentation like here, I think that helps a lot because it kind of bridges that, right? I mean, you get input from people. You mentioned participation before, Chris, right? And that's a way of bringing in participation of the people that then will actually, within work organizations, work with these things. And that helps them, first of all, give their knowledge also, which probably is important, and also for them to, to be more in control. And I think that that is a, is a key to having that augmentation that you were talking about. So, so if, may, I, may I follow up on that? Well, actually, I wanted okay. to uh, um, ask a question. Um, Chiho, ask a question. Because um, you, are, you are working on, on printing concrete, among other questions. And, um, and actually, Chris said, everything that is not convenient will uh, disappear and make place for new, co more convenient techniques. Now, casting concrete and, and uh, building this cast very manually, it's, it's, it's hard work, it's uh, dirty work, uh, you do it in the heat, you do it in the cold, um, it's, uh, it's manual work on the site, and this all could be replaced by a printer. Um, how realistic is this? So when, when will we see the first printer on a Swiss construction site? <laughs> I do not mean nest, I mean a normal one. Um, that's a very, good luck. Very good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if we came up with that answer at the conference necessarily. Um, you know, I think it's still an open question where this technology is going to go in terms of digital fabrication using these sorts of approaches. Um, but, you know, I think right now what we're trying to do is. Um, you know, assemble the kind of expertise and knowledge that we have and then direct that towards this new application. Um, hopefully, like ETH, um, do it in partnership with architects and structural um, engineers um, and psychologists. Um, but um, yeah, and then after we sort of assemble that information and exchange ideas and also see what the need mm -hmm. um, of the industry is, then I think we can start to see where digital fabrication can fit at, at this moment in time. And then, so I don't know when that's going to be, I don't know um, what that's going to be, but I think that's um, going to be the starting point. And then from there, um, maybe we'll get to the point where we can replace a construction site with just automation. But, you know, at this point, um, I don't think we have a good handle on that. Robert, I hope this is okay. Um, but it's um, in identifying what the uh, suitable application is. How far are we from printing a house on Mars in concrete? I think that's a good application. Well, well landing pads was proposed, um, which I think is a very suitable application. <laughs> Can I? No, yes. you wanted to. Yes. Go ahead, you go ahead, then I'll go ahead. I'd like to pop Just in. because I, the, the House of Marty said it's a very good application, I agree. But does it make sense? Because we know that if we throw a lot of money at the problem, and uh, we have an, you know, a, a political whatever reason to, to get there, then we are able to do it. But this doesn't mean 
that this thing will change our reality because exactly. on uh, our local condition and uh, Chris uh, gave enough uh, call information on the complexity of the context we live in, this can be absolutely uh, insignificant. You know. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that trying to, to, to reach this benchmark as fast as possible is a problem, you know, but then this doesn't guarantee us you know, that, that, that we are already there. You know, yeah. Then we have to reconsider everything. And I think that this, uh, let's say, path, you suggested it will be much more, uh, let's say... Fluid. Fluid, yeah. You know, our industry is, all around the world, our industry is fundamentally a small and medium-sized enterprise-driven industry. And very often, with an SME, change in, in, pro, uh, change in product and process is very timely and expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time, very expensive and difficult. Right? So this is one of the reasons our productivity is, a, a, one of the reasons given for our productivity being so low. So how are we going to get, how can we get the change to occur which we're hoping for? Um, one, and there's a couple ways to me that we can be doing that. One is by building codes or codes. Singapore has said if you, if you do prefabrication, you get more floors. You know, phew, you know everything's, everyone's focused on prefab right now in Singapore. Yeah. Right? So you get more floors and you get results. The reason they've done that is because in Singapore, they want to outsource the acquisition of sand and water because Singapore has no more sand and they import all their water. So if you prefab something, you're importing sand and water. Right? So they've solved two problems at once. So there's a code-driven innovation push that's really quite fascinating, I think. Um, the second is what I call it the follow me. You create the parade with, with leadership and leaders who then others want to follow. And this is where you, you have the small, medium-sized enterprises who come on board and they show how they were able to change and improve their process, make more money, and do better. That's the follow me. And this is where the nest, where the lab becomes important, and all of us become the leaders of parades. Right? So we can create the parades which others will then fall into. At the end of the day, as was mentioned this morning, as again and again, if, 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 our, if our suggestions are more damaging to the environment, cost more, take longer, they will never be implemented, nor should they be. So the focus on the research needs to be how to kick those three things down as deep as possible. And so this is where the loss-leading research becomes critical, Right? Every building site in Switzerland has a crane. It doesn't have a gantry crane. No other place in the world I know of, except maybe Hong Kong or Singapore, has a crane at every building site. Right? So what, we, what will happen in time is these methods get tried and, and you guys figure out how to do these things with holding pieces and welding and drilling. Eventually the methods will evolve into something which can go to a gantry crane, which can go to an exoskeleton, and can be adapted and implemented on smaller scales. And that, to me, is an, the exci super exciting part is where we focus on the different problems as we're moving towards that you know, data-driven planetary boundary design. And I think that's where we've got to get to. I think the first uh, nice uh, step in such a direction of uh, handling complexity is to be able to include us in the process, yes. not just as uh, inventors, scientists, uh, yeah. uh, planners, but really in the physical process. And uh, because, uh, I mean, still many people you talk with uh, in industry and in politics in Singapore, especially, they have the vision of the human-free building site. You know, not not understanding that this will be just too expensive. Yeah. That does not make any sense. And if you have a, a certain, uh, uh, let's say, routine <laughs> with technology, then you know what the price of the last 2% are. And, uh, and, and this is exactly uh, 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 where the problem starts and where probably if you want to go on Mars, and it is clear, bringing humans up there is yeah. so much more expensive than the last 2% than you do it. Yeah. You know? But here, on the residential, you, know, you don't do it. So, 
uh, it gives us a completely new perspective of reframing the, technology, the powerful technologies we have and making them realistic on the mid, yeah. short and mid term, you know, not just in this but binary you know, yeah. solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this is also a, a social and, and political issue. So uh, an example in, in Switzerland, a structural engineer is paid uh, in relation to the material that he builds. So the more concrete you build, the more concrete you use, the, 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 the more you get paid. So you, you, you don't have any interest <laughs> in, uh, in use less and in, in building more efficient um, buildings. Of course, uh, we have very innovative structural engineers who, who, who try to, <laughs> to evolve and evolve, but the, most of them are just interested in the money. And I mean, one understands, I mean, that's, that's, that's their living. So when you, um, Chris, um, quoted this, this uh, example from Singapore, where um, you get rewarded if you do not use um, the local sand, but try to, um, to, to, to find another solution, a more economical and more ecological solution, you get re rewarded to it, then that's a political decision. Um, that yeah. this, this is a rule made in order to achieve uh, yeah. something. So maybe um, we as builders, and uh, if, if we really um, mean it with, uh, with our ecological imprint, that should be uh, a little bit smaller. Maybe you should, um, the, the building sector, the planners, uh, the researchers should also uh, be a little bit more political. I mean, how realistic is that? But I, to, sorry, because I'm just curious. I mean, I understood your example that Singapore gets around the problem of sand and, and, and the other countries not being allowed to export sand to Singapore by actually having the stuff produced somewhere else. So it's not the sand that gets imported, but it, the mm -hmm. whatever built thing gets imported. So that to me is not a particularly ecological thing. It's just no, a way of circumventing <laughs> rules, yeah. right? Yes, <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm, I'm not I, sure I whether I got say, it right. No, it's, it's not, it's not um, I do not say that this is the solution, but maybe yeah. then uh, you start to prefabricate uh, in other materials. Mm. I mean, there are materials that, that are much yeah, easier to prefabricate than, yeah. uh, than uh, concrete mm. and are lighter and easier mm. to, to mount. But, but we have to make a distinction between why and, and what incentive and motivation is. In the case of Singapore, it's a clear incentive. They want to do something for that reason. That doesn't mean it's ecologically correct, but it is also politically another way of colonization. And as an immigrant, I can speak about that clearly because that's what happened to Africa and many other places where you had a, a need and a desire from the most powerful people in the world, like Singapore at the moment, who wanted, who had a different incentive and motivation that's not the same as technical disciplines, mm -hmm. it's political, social, or religious sometimes. And, and that we have to make that distinction very carefully from our positions, I think. Otherwise you end up doing, you print a house in Mars without asking yourself why. Which, which you did, I think, so. And I think the, the question is about incentives, because what they do in Singapore, and you can like it or not, is they have a, 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 a planned economy, and uh, they just tell, uh, okay, uh, from next year, January 1st, uh, either you bring 20% of prefabrication, the stuff you, you do, or you will not get any jobs anymore. And uh, this thing we, we do, cannot do, we want, will not do it he, here uh, uh, in, in, our count, uh, in, in, in our culture. And uh, the problem we fight with is not so much that the engineer is maybe paid in relation to the amount of steel, but the biggest problem we have, and this is if we talk about 3D printing concrete, uh, getting rid of formwork, all these wonderful things, it's still we live in a reality where a cubic meter of concrete costs nothing. You know, so thinking about how to reduce it a half doesn't make any sense in economical terms, you know, because I, every second I spend thinking about this, not in academia, but in a, in a profitable yeah. firm, you know, I lose money. You know? And if you look at how, you know, once the, the, the formwork is in place, filling it up doesn't cost. You can, you can pour, you, often on, on the, you know, the Arctic problem. But is know? it really true that you... In Switzerland, you get paid for more concrete. I'm, I'm not so convinced in defense of the engineers. 
Yes. It is. We, we don't find money a dirty word, by the way. But, but it's not quite like that. In London, the, certainly it's changed. Uh, one of the competitions that we built was, the comp competition was this 26-story building. They challenged all the engineers to come up with how much more can you put on top using new technology. And we won. We put 12 stories on top of a 26-story building. Lightweight. So the incentive was profit, but not necessarily geared to material. It was geared to area because to rebuild and time to rebuild the tall building of that height would have taken so long again you're introducing a valuable potentially sustainable idea in reappropriating technology and the only way we were able to do this by the way was through technology well but those are the diverging uh, interests of the of uh... yeah the why question yeah. <clears throat> yes we did it for money, just so it's clear. I just yeah. wanted to say <laughs> no. that, that, that Judith is right. Uh, the, the, this is the tradition we come from, and it's the same as the architect is paid in relationship of, to the cost of the building, what has the yeah. same uh, mechanism, but the reality of the profession is changing rapidly. So nobody pays you any more in relation to how much money you spend. Uh, you know, do you have other... Uh, Things, but it's in transition, and there are many different interests involved. But I, I just sense that uh, uh, using as little material as possible uh, right now, in, at least in Switzerland, is not incentivized yeah. in any way. You know, because I can do it for ideal reason, for research reason, for whatever PR reason, but not for economical reason. As a planner, as an investor, as whatever. You know. And this has to change, but given the fact that we are not in Singapore, you know, we need to find other mechanisms. Maybe it's again the building culture that has to come, or the education, or something like this that has to help, out, help us out on this. Okay. Now, um, our, our time slot is over. So, <laughs> I'm very, very sorry to interrupt this discussion, but maybe uh, we can continue it uh, afterwards. I just tried to recapitulate what we have heard and uh, it's quite difficult because we had a lot of uh, subjects but um, I tried to identify four main subjects. Actually, um, maybe as a starting point um, I can take um, the uh, ecological uh, question. So, in, in what future are we heading and how can we make our future sustainable? And if we take this as a, as a goal, then we can say it, we need innovation because we are, humanity is growing, wealth is growing. If we want to satisfy all those humans um, that, are, that are coming, we need new solutions. We have a lot of very evolved new technologies uh, that are quite complex. The questions are also complex. So in order to handle this complexity, we need specialists from different disciplines because no one can have all the knowledge uh, in one head. So we need interdisciplinary teams, we need communication in these teams and then uh, of course we have the question how can we organize those interdisciplinary teams, how can we um, empower the participants of such an interdisciplinary research team and also in the practice um, to, to open up, to trust the others, to share the knowledge and to develop new ideas together without a fear of uh, failing and, and not be respected by the others of the team. This is, um, of course, um, a question that can be treated first in academia because here we have a kind of, of a, of a um, secure place where we can uh, try different methods and different working um, schedules. Um, especially digitalization and the ways that it opens for fabrication is an eminently uh, interdisciplinary field. Um, it opens also a lot of questions. Uh, robots um, are uh, seen with, uh, well, with fascination and optimism, but also with fears. Will the robots take our jobs? No, they won't. They Partly yes, but then they will create new ones. New ones for whom? Are we ready? Are we learning fast enough? Are we adapting fast enough? A lot of questions arising. Um, 
and how we, do we cope with it? How this is a question for academia, which should not only um, form young people and throw them out into the praxis, but enable them also to have a continuous formation uh, to be able to adapt also in future. Because the evolution is quicker than we are. So education has a lot of aims. Um, not, all, not only knowledge, but also capacities. And um, Fabio, you, you said the word experience, which uh, is quite strong because it's a, it's a very holistic conception of a person, not only on the intellectual, but also on, on, on an, an emotional level, which is quite important. And then the fourth theme, research and practice. How can we get into the practice? How can we implement the innovation that was developed um, into the practical life, into the, the reality of building. We have seen that those are really small steps, but important steps that open new perspectives that maybe enable us also to conceive even bigger changes and quicker changes, other changes. So these tools we are working with, they enable us to uh, build the future, but they also are our tools. So we can develop them in order to uh, get to the place we want to get, to the future that we want to shape. Mm. So that was, uh, that was a really, really big panorama. And I'm sure you would like to deepen every single topic that we have touched today. Um, so we have something left for the future. Now our immediate future is the apero. <laughs> That's a perfect place. Um, to communicate. Thank you very much to uh, all the panelists for the participation. Thank you so much um, to listen, to think with us. Goodbye and cheers. Thank you.